setting up their machines was known as the double indicator. It was to be the Enigma's Achilles heel. The instruction sheets for each day told the German operator how to set up his Enigma. They specified the order of the rotors and the position of the ring of letters around each rotor. The sheets then provided instructions for wiring up the plug board. All Enigmas on a network had to be set up identically for the system to work. There was one extra level of security. If the enemy captured the instruction sheets, they would be able to read all the messages. To prevent this, each message had its own secret rotor setting, chosen by the operator. First, the operator had to pick three random letters. He sent these in plain text to the operator at the receiving end, allowing that other person to line up his machine identically. But now the operator had to be able to tell the operator at the receiving end what the actual message settings from which, they were going to, from which he was going to start enciphering the message. And that had to be conveyed to the operator the other end, but not revealed to any interceptor. And the way that they chose to do this was to use the Enigma machine itself to conceal this message setting. So the operator encoded a second group of three letters as the secret message setting itself. And supposing he thought of SWJ. And when he keys in S W, J, the lamps light up I, T, V. Because the Germans felt that radio transmissions might be unreliable, they went a step further and they actually asked the operator at the sending end to key in the message setting twice. So the procedure was to key in S, W, J, S, W, J, and to note down all six lamps that lit. And that was a crucial mistake because the repetition of the message setting gives a cryptographer a toehold into finding out what it actually is. Repetitions are always bad news in cryptography. By encoding the same letters twice, the Germans gave the codebreakers their first clue about the setting of the Enigma rotors. Soon, there was a second clue. The Poles had noticed a strange quirk in the way the rotors worked. In about one out of eight intercepts, the Enigma was turning one of the letters in the message setting into the same coded letter twice. The mistake of sending the message setting twice was revealing a flaw in the machine itself. Although it was designed to produce random coded letters, there were certain situations in which the enigma was much less random than the Germans believed. There is no such thing as a random, a truly random sequence that can be generated by a purely deterministic machine uh, that just cannot be. Uh, it's part of the definition of randomness that it cannot be explained or predicted in any way whatsoever. The whole game of cipher design is to design machines which are flawed, they have to be, but in which the flaws are as small, inconspicuous as possible. It was just such a flaw that broke the enigma. At Bletchley Park, the repeated letters were called females. Only a few configurations of the machine could produce these females. If the codebreakers now worked their way through them, they would find that day's settings. The codebreakers produced huge cards known as Jeffrey's sheets with holes punched through in an alphabetical grid representing the wheel positions that could produce females.
By lining the sheets over each other, the code breakers could hunt through the wheel positions to find out how the Enigma had been set up for that day. They were John Jeffries, they were really his rather special baby. And they were on sort of cartridge weight paper, not very thick card, they got very dog eared. And as far as I remember, they were two alphabets, that way and that way. It was like solving a very difficult crossword puzzle. You could actually see it happening. And the triumph when you found it worked, that was fascinating. Marvellous, absolutely marvellous. There's nothing like seeing a code broken. <laughs> that is really absolutely the tops. The one thing that was very interesting was that people were very reluctant to go home at the end of the shift. There was a certain amount of move over, you know, that let me sit down and get on with it. People wanted to hang in there. <laughs> on one occasion I was on the evening shift but when midnight came, I was stuck in a message that was, had gripped me so hard, I worked right through till breakfast time, from four o'clock in the afternoon till breakfast the next day, simply because this had to get done. In the spring of 1941, the naval war was building up in the Mediterranean. Hitler had joined forces with the Italian fascist Mussolini. Both dictators were dreaming of global empires. The Allies knew that the Germans had given Enigma machines to the Italians. One of the codebreakers trying to break into the Italian messages was 19-year-old Mavis Leva. Sometimes you'd have to spend the whole night assuming every position that there could be on the three different wheels. And uh, there we call them red, blue and green, the wheels. I think they did too. So that you, you would have to work at it very, very hard. And it was that, I think, that made one pink-eyed and one, after you'd done it for a few hours, you wondered, you know, whether you'd ever see anything when it was before your eyes because you were so snarled up in it all. Mavis and the other codebreakers didn't know it. But they were about to make their first major impact on the war. The one that came up was real good stuff, drama. Today's the day minus three, just that, nothing else. And so, of course, we knew that something was going to happen. The Italians were going to do something in the Italian Navy in three days' time. Why they had to say that, I can't imagine. It seemed rather daft, but still, they did. The British fleet was based in the Egyptian port of Alexandria. Under the command of Admiral Andrew Cunningham, Bletchley Park intercepted a message that would lead the Admiral to hatch a clever plan. Well, then a very, very large message came in, which was the battle orders, how many cruisers there were and how many submarines were to be there and where they were to be at such and such a time. Absolutely incredible that they should uh, really spell it all out. Mavis had decoded just the message that Cunningham needed to outwit the Italians. It was 11 o'clock at night and it was pouring with rain when I rushed, ran, absolutely tore down to take it to the Italian intelligence to get it across to Cunningham. Within hours, the decoded message was on its way to Cunningham in Egypt. The Italian fleet was gathering off Cape Matapan on the Greek coast. Their plan was to attack a British convoy at midnight. Alexandria was a nest of spies. The problem for Cunningham was how to act on the message without giving his plans away. If he led the fleet out to sea, the Italians would know immediately. Cunningham embarked on an elaborate ruse to fool the spies. He wanted his enemies to believe that all was quiet. He did a real Drake on them, and, well, more than Drake, because he played golf and pretended he was, you know, just going to have a, you know, weekend off. 
Albert Cunningham was a crafty fellow. 